Welcome to Live Sessions with a GM. My name is Guy, and I'm from How to Be a Great GM. Joining me this evening is a wonderful guest who is a very good friend of mine, Mike. Hello, Mike. Hello. And Mike Harris, for those who don't know, he runs the YouTube channel Game Masters Vault, and uh, has been a fan of the channel for a long time. We got to meet last time I was in the US, and now he's been housing me whilst I've been hanging out uh, here in the USA. I also... Uh, we have a new little friend here who's uh, joined me. Uh, we're going to decide on his name during the show today. I saw him at Gen Con and absolutely fell in love with this little critter. So we will talk about him a little bit later on. We've got an action-packed show for you today. Um, talk about all kinds of cool and wonderful things. Mike is uh, going to be uh, sharing and imparting his wisdom with us. I thought let's just give you guys a whole bunch of options for you to, 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 to look at tonight. Still, of course, doing Q&A. So if you have questions about your games, your sessions, your characters, your plots, your stories... This is the place to ask them. Mike's got some amazing advice. Uh, so hit him up with great questions. Now, um, going to be talking about two things on the show tonight, as well as all of the usual random chaos, etc., etc. We're going to be talking about Gen Con. Mike and I went to Gen Con last week and uh, had an absolute blast, I think. It was mm. chaos. Was it last week or was this weekend, wasn't it? wasn't even last weekend it was this last pre previous like five days we, ago we came back on monday we came back on monday that's how crazy it's been since coming back i see questions are coming through already fantastic i see canada's watching hello daniel perone from canada um you want to call him steve says jason uh, mcclellan i'm not sure about steve is he look like steve no nah, i don't think it's steve I don't know about a Steve. Uh, we'll see. So snuffles, maybe snuffles. I uh, snuffles. Yes, yeah, snuffles. Fluff ball is another option. Uh, we'll see which ones uh, he responds to the most. Uh, now we've got some questions already coming in, and uh, White Tiger two two five says I'm designing a spear that is a long red winged serpent wrapped around a shaft with a gout of metallic flame sticking out from its head uh, of the spear. And I lost my notes. I need to figure out how or what abilities. To give it all over again. A f f sphere with a metallic serpent with flame coming out of its mouth. What abilities to give it? I think the real question is, what are you going to be using the spear for? Is it going to be in your... Uh uh, is it in your campaign to act as a sacred artifact? Is it something that the character is going to be looking for? Is it something the character is going to be using? Uh, those are the things off the top of my head. Mike, your thoughts? Sphere? Well, sphere? if it's a if it's a red winged serpent, that's probably got to be some kind of extra fire damage, uh, or fire resistance, or fire breath, or something to do with fire uh, is what I would put on it. I think that's yeah, absolutely. If you set it up, if you establish it, you're going to use it, right? Is he putting you off? Well, no, he's just like having a seizure or something. I don't know what the hell is going on. <laughs> I don't know what's going on either. There's more snuffles votes there. Oh dear, I think it's going to be snuffles. Uh, Skittles is another one from uh, Nystagmim. What Nystagmimian? Nystagmimim. Anyway, all right. So there we go. We've given you some things to 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 think about and. Uh, if you are new to the channel, it's not usually this chaotic. It's just that uh, I happen to be staying with Mike and uh, having a blast whilst doing so. Um, if you're going to ask questions, put the word question in the front in big, bold caps, if you please, so that we can see it popping out um, as uh, as easily as, as possible. So that would be really, really cool. Uh, if you've just joined us, my guest is Mike Harris from the YouTube channel Game Masters Vault. Uh, Mike and I have actually been working on something else as well as Gen Con, which we're going to be talking about tonight uh, too on the show. And that is the new book that we've been talking about for a long, long, long time. And um, Mike has become my official editor on the book. And it's been quite a task uh we're still going through it nearly done nearly done it has grown significantly from when it started we're on draft eight uh it's pretty cool you pretty guys cool. are welcome <laughs> yes more um, for you to read absolutely more for you to read more stuff more cool stuff really 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 cool stuff we want to unpack a little bit of that as well uh so uh yes let's uh, look at some questions topico boy says what's your advice for making large amounts of maps 
without spending hours. Uh, Topico boy, I guess that you're new to the YouTube channel. Uh, if you need to make those maps this year, well mm. then, good luck to you. I think Wonderdraft is going to be your best bet. It's a piece of software that allows you to make maps and things. Uh, if you would ask that next year, I would have to say without any shadow of a doubt, that would be the Deos suite from the Project Deos. I um, don't actually have it loaded up on the screens, but Project Deos, of course, very near and dear to my heart. That's through Dungeon Fog, dungeonfog.com. They're running a Kickstarter at the moment. That's going to allow you to make maps. And what's really cool is, let's say you make your world map, you're then going to be able to click on regions in that, and it will auto-generate them for you based on your world map. It's, it's just mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. Cannot wait for it to come out. So there we go. Yeah, looks awesome. It it really does. It really does look awesome. Uh, writing machine says, any advice for my first novel? Yay! And using those homebrewed ideas for my games. Okay, well let's tackle the first novel thing uh, first. And I I always say writers. That's that's where you need to start. You need to start writing it. Now I was talking to World Anvil the other day. She, um, Janet from World Anvil was with us at Gen Con. So much fun. Um, Janet, just absolutely adored Janet. And we were talking about stuff. And she said, well, Google Docs. Now, I didn't know this. I've only just discovered this. So, so watch this space as well. Is Google Docs will allow you to speak. And it automatically types up text for you. So if you've got a nice clear voice, it's pretty good. Mike and I were playing around with it last night. Uh, it's fairly intuitive in terms of how you add paragraphs and delete stuff. You literally just say next paragraph or new paragraph and it, it figures out what you're trying to do. Um, and this, of course, you're writing a sentence in which the character says new paragraph. Then you might have problems. But <laughs> <laughs> that's what editors are for. <laughs> so there we are. Um, I was really surprised that it was, was hearing my voice from, from behind Guy as well. Guy, right. Guy was doing this, and I was behind him at my computer, and it was picking up everything I was saying to him, too. It was pretty funny. It, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it was really cool. Uh, okay. We've got some more. Qu uh, let's take questions. We're going to take questions until quarter past. We're going to talk about Gen Con, I think. So, uh, Luna Love God, I think, is the next question that we can see on the screen. Uh, before we get there, just remember, if I miss your question, because the questions, as you can see behind me, are coming through thick and fast. If I missed your question, ask it again, if you so please. Uh, don't worry about spamming, just ask it again. So, Luna Love Good says, I'm doing a one-on-one, -on -one, and my player has the habit of waiting for me to point them in a direction whenever they are able to do whatever they ask out of game what to do. Um, hmm. So the player is basically just following along the story that you are telling by the sounds of things. That uncertainty, I think, is going to be very difficult to, to work through um, without having a serious conversation with them. I would actually just breach it, uh, just broach the subject in your next session and say, I am making a lot of decisions for you. I want you to try and make decisions on your own. I think that's going to be a, a, an effective approach there. Mike, any thoughts on that? Well, I guess I would probably run it more like a, a choose your own adventure. Um, give your player one, two, three options, well, two or three options of what they want to do uh, in the game. Yeah. So you're not you're not necessarily railroading them, but you're saying these are a couple different options that you could do. Unless you can think of something else to do, then these are your couple different options. I like that. I do like mm -hmm. that. Choose an adventure. Absolutely a great idea. I'm going to punt it because I love them so much. Fabled Lands could be an option for you to have a look at. Very complex uh, choose an adventure. Fabled Lands. Very complex, but at the same time, I think probably the best choose an adventure series in terms of allowing it to be a bit more narrative. I'm actually doing that for a podcast for all of the Patreons, the $3 Patreons. I did four episodes, I think of playing through the Fabled Lands. And what was interesting about that was that uh, it's a bit of a spoiler. So if you're thinking of picking up those podcasts, uh, listen not for the next three or so minutes. Um, the first character died in the first 20 minutes. So I thought, well, either I make a new character or I do something different. So what I did was I said, well, OK, fine. The, the, the new character is actually the brother of the, the dead character and I'm now going to go look for him. So I made up some, imp I, I improvised some dialogue and uh, I used what was in the book, Overlord for, uh, Frost 01, thank you so much for that, 
Really do appreciate. You're our new monster. Overlord Frost. I quite like that. We must defeat Overlord Frost. Um, so yeah, I made up I made up a whole bunch of stuff and still worked within the book. So that was that was pretty awesome uh, to, to do. And so you could certainly apply that as well. Um, I think that's a, a, a pretty good a pretty good pretty good response, Mike. It's nice having you on the show. <laughs> All right. It is almost quarter past. So many questions. I love it. So many, so many questions. Uh, Joel Bird asks, any suggestions on creating port cities for a sailing adventure? Hmm. Well, the, the main thing that I would say when you're doing any kind of a, a port or coastal town or whatever is give that town the total feel of being on the coast. Their main export uh, is going to be fish. Uh, if they're on a coastal town or some kind of seafood. So you've got to have places where they can buy sails and rigging and taverns for the sailors to go into and all of those other kind of things. Just make it more uh, sailing and coastal centric is, is how I would do any kind of a coastal town. Absolutely. I would also look and see, and I'm not saying this because my book is there, but also something to look at would be, well, what defenses does it have against uh, nautical attack? Is it, does it have bastions? Are there towers? Are there lighthouses? That kind of thing. Uh, definitely something to look at there. And what are the trade options? What are coming in and what are coming out? I do have to do a shout out to Toshi AU. I see you there. Uh, hello back to you as well. Right. It is quarter past. Let's talk Gen Con for a little bit. Okay. All right. So Gen Con, don't fall asleep if you, if you haven't been to Gen Con. This is not us going, oh, we had a marvelous time and you weren't there. This is us looking at it going, I think we could say that we had a great time. Mm -hmm. But what did we learn? What did we take away? So that if you are going next year, it's something that you can think about and sort of be cognizant of. And we wanted to do this now, so it's kind of fresh top of mind and, 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 and that kind of thing. Uh, Grizzle says at least one brothel. Yes, absolutely. I think that is also important for coastal towns, is, is sailors got a reputation for that reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Mike, Gen Con, we were there for Thursday, for Friday, for Saturday, and for Sunday. So all four days. Mm -hmm. It was absolute chaos. Uh, mm -hmm. Mike came with me, and uh, we ran... Well, I, I did two panels. One was uh, on my own, and then one was with World Anvil. And then, Mike, you went to a whole bunch of panels, didn't you? I went to a total of eight seminars. All right, so you went to eight seminars. Seminars, sorry. That's the other thing I've been learning about while I'm in America, is all the different different phrases of what we talk about in terms of these things. So, mm -hmm. so you went to eight seminars. Yep. Uh, what were they on? Sort of just, just off the top of the top of your head. Uh, well, I did go to yours and the the one with uh, you and Janet, uh, right. the world building ones. And those, honestly, those were probably two of my favorite ones out of the eight. Um, there was another Is one. Because he's on the show. Uh, no, actually, <laughs> out of the ones that I went to, yeah. Um, the one on Sunday uh, was a, an industry behind the scenes kind of talk that was very interesting. I learned a lot from that. Um, there were others that were a complete letdown in, in my opinion, based on what was in the, uh, the event booklet um, that you can, you can get ahead of time to it describes what the, they're going to be talking about. And some of them were like way off from what they really talked about. I went to one, uh, what was that? That would have been Saturday night. Is that when you did the, the live? Yes. Yeah. So Saturday night, I went to a seminar uh, put on by a great author, Robin D. Laws. I don't know if you guys have heard of Robin D. Laws or if you haven't, go look up Robin D. Laws in Amazon and he's got some great RPG type books. Um, so I went to his seminar thinking it was going to be one thing and it turned out to be something completely different. Um, I got a selfie with the guy. He was very yeah. nice and wonderful, but it just wasn't quite what I was expecting out of that seminar. So right. you definitely want to read those event listings very closely so that you know. Uh, it was kind of a rush. It was kind of a last minute thing that I was going to go. Um, so I didn't have the months and months and months to sit there and pour through everything and pick, <laughs> pick stuff out. Yeah. So. yeah, that was pretty good. And yes, Adrian, we met you there. It was super awesome. It was actually just random luck that we met uh, met you there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that brings me to, to the next point. So yes, you were talking about the seminars and sort of going to them and, and, and not being particularly happy with them. I only managed to attend two. Uh, the one which was brilliant, I absolutely enjoyed it and made copious amounts of notes. And there will be a video on Great GM on that specific thing. The other one I went to, I only took away one thing. 
but and, I, and at the time I thought well, that's not really worth it but it did it did I think later on prove to be valuable so yeah now on to that idea with 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 where we met Adrian um the the way that Gen Con works is you purchase tickets to go to these seminars and things, mm -hmm. and then you have to go and fetch them. Now, I didn't know this. Uh, was it you who discovered why it was called that? You have to go and fetch them from a place called Will Call. Mm -hmm. you, did you find out why, what it meant, where it came from? Someone it's, did. It's, I was with someone. It's an old theater thing, That's if it. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Correct. Right. It's, it's, it's an old theater thing. So I was looking for tickets, collect tickets, do, do whatever. Anyway, apparently, yes. Yeah. So you go to the will call thing. Now, we were told by Nerdarchy to go early. And let me tell you, we, we, were, luck we were so lucky that we did. I think every day we just got there earlier and earlier to make sure that we got them to, into the mm -hmm. space. The line moves quickly, but by midday, that line stretched from one end of the ICC all the way to the other. It was insane. Um, so that would be some advice is, is get there at sort of 7.30 in the morning. Make sure that you, you, you do that. I think that's very, very important. Um, Tim Depp and I see you had, a, you had a great time at my seminars. I'm glad um, that, uh, that you did. Um, I had a lot of fun doing them, I must admit. Next year, we're looking at it saying, okay, well, um, our goal, my goal anyway, to go to Gen Con was to meet up with as many publishing houses as we could. And we ended up meeting with eight of them. And we had eight very important and very enthusiastic meetings, I should say. So the channel, there's stuff coming. Don't It's it's going to be mind-blowing, I hope. So we're busy in the process of that. It's just been a week uh, since it's getting back. But um, so that was kind of going on. Next year, we want to do more seminars. We want to do more panels and things because I think it was so much fun um, to do them and, and run some games and stuff as well. Four more minutes of Gen Con and then we're going to go and uh, go back to questions. Um, and I yeah. do see that uh, Pedro is here in the chat. Uh, he was at the Arcanus booth. Um, bri oh. Brilliant book. Br yes. Brilliant book. Um, it was so nice to, to meet you and talk with you while we were there. Um, I already had your book and, uh, the other guy, Eric, that we were with That's bought right. your book and bought another one and, and they're just dying for me to run a game, uh, in that world. So, um, I will be doing that probably sometime this fall, starting a whole new campaign just with that, just that, with that, that setting. Book, yeah. It does look absolutely beautiful. Yeah. It really, 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 really <laughs> does. Um, okay. So that was it. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think now what other points I wanted to talk about. My notes are so far away. Um, I'm going to lean forward here. 7.30 will call. Um, oh, yes. Okay. So meals were actually a bit of a thing that became a problem because of timing. So it's not likely that if you are going to Gen Con, you're going to be doing the crazy stuff that I was doing, which was meetings, 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 meetings. Or uh, running between seminars or, and seminars and seminars. Right. And the dealer hall. And, That's what you're more likely to yeah, be doing, yes. Yeah. So it's important to realize that to get from one space in the ICC to another space in the ICC is going to take you, on average, 20 minutes, at least, on either side. So don't book back to back to back to back to back. I think that's just too, it's too insane. Mm -hmm. um, make sure you've got 20 minutes on either side of your seminars to get or on your events or your games or whatever. 20 minutes. When it comes to food, I would say 40 minutes. You did the food trucks Did outside. you want to eat? <laughs> if well, you only 40 took 40 minutes, minutes to, to wait. eat, you didn't eat nothing. Yes, yes, yes. It, it really did take a long time to, to get into food. So, I mean, you did the food trucks once, and you were in that queue for quite some time. Yeah, it was it was a pretty long queue. We were in line for probably a good half an hour before we got our food, right. and then you have to sit down and find a place to, to sit, sit down and eat. And um, it, was, it was pretty nuts. So uh, definitely bring different snacks. Um, yeah. Bring a refillable water bottle with you. That will help out too. Um, I see Dead Aussie Gamers in the uh, chat. He did the back-to-back -back thing. He didn't yeah. really sleep. You know, I booked accommodation for, for, for four of us, and Dead Aussie Gamer was in one of them. I, I don't think he actually used the room very much. You were sharing with him, actually. Yeah, I don't think he slept at all. <laughs> he was just so. <laughs> running on pure adrenaline or something because exactly. I would go to sleep before he would, and I would wake up, and he would already be up. So... 
You don't, don't eat. I don't think he I don't think he slept. <laughs> I don't think so either. I see Adrian there says you don't eat, you inhale. Yeah. Uh yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, look at that DM. Thank you for that. Really do appreciate that. Um okay, let's go back to some questions. Let's go back to some questions now. Uh coming in from you guys. I see there's one there. Anti Evergreen says, Are God meant to be Four in fourth tier of epic tier levels and ventures. What does that mean? Are gods meant to be four in fourth tier of epic tier levels and adventure and ventures? Does it mean anything to you? I'm trying to think. I don't know. They're they're words. They're words. Evergreen, maybe try that question again. What do you mean by tears? I've not heard of it as tears. I know that gods are very powerful. What game are you talking about? Let's unpack that first, maybe, uh, and and get there. Uh, oh, I see Mark Minor says gods are a game-breakingly powerful as the DM makes them. I even have Vecna turn a reckless player into a goldfish once. Yes. I that, love... That player was lucky. <laughs> absolutely. I love playing with the gods, and I love the gods interfering and doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Um, so I like gods, but yes, they can be incredibly powerful. I do have a, a system where if a player prays to a god, well, if the player's character pray, prays to a god, they get to roll a d100. And if they roll a one, the god responds. And mm -hmm. if their request is within the god's purview, so if it's within their space, the god might grant it. If it's not, if it's just the player going, oh, I pray to my god for a million gold pieces, and their god is the god of, say, humility, the god will just cause them to cease existing because yeah. they've wasted that, that sort of time. So um, It would have to be at least indifferent to the god, if not yes. beneficial to the god, to grant the request. The request, yeah. correct, correct, correct. So I think that's quite fun. Uh, another question from Honorable596. Have you ever considered running a campaign where all of the humans, elves, and orcs have bred each other out of existence and being replaced with the superior half-kin, or quarter-kin, I suppose, or third-kin, really, relatives. A campaign with only half-elves and half-orcs. So a half-elf is a health, and a half-orc is an or. So you'd have a... a whore. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> you see what happens when you do the mind thing, the yeah. word game? You've got to remember, you, you know, that's the sort of thing that happens. Um... Honorable, I haven't thought about the, that kind of world. I think what you're talking about there really is a point of where you go, okay, so what now are you going to express with that? Are you going to now suddenly start having groups who are trying to breed back the original races? Is there going to be something that uh, is causing them to revert to the natural state? So some kind of weird genetic malady where people go to sleep one moment, they wake up the next day and suddenly they're elvish or, the, you know... It, 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 yeah what 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 what's 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 kind of going on on uh, in terms of your campaign setting would be would be something to look at i think uh picklesaurus uh, picklesaurus picklesaurus says how would you recommend using a demon as the villain of a campaign their motivations tend to be fairly basic to like create chaos devise destruction and gain mucho power i'm having trouble making the demon more interesting as a character have you ever done demons uh no not really i haven't either demons are very powerful obviously i mean that's 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 why they're there and you are right demons do seem to be one track what i do find quite interesting is that demons are the nemeses of devils they are the arch nemeses mm -hmm. of devils so perhaps there's something to look there and say okay well you've got this demon um their needs are fairly basic but what if their need is to bring about the destruction of a devil or to destroy a devil so they could take over the devil's domain, for example. That could be interesting, especially if initially they come across as being a mentor type of nemesis to the party. So they're helping the party. Oh, there's a de you know, there's a devil. We must try and get rid of the devil. Get rid of the devil. Get rid of the devil. And then eventually it's, it's discovered that the devil is just doing devilly things, but that the demon is trying to get the party to kill them. That could be something that you could look at. Um, Angus Boy says, I've just acquired a new group, yay, and we're doing a session zero tomorrow. Woohoo! They seem to be used to high fantasy classic D&D. &D. How do I introduce them to my low fantasy setting? Well, it's session zero, so that's where you start. Mike, what would you suggest? You did a great video on session zeros. Um, yeah, session zero, that's, the, that's where you do it. And, and good for you for doing session zeros. I know a lot of GMs and DMs do not even do session zeros, and I think that they're very important, and I know you agree. Um, 
when you're talking about a low fantasy, more of a gritty, realistic setting, and we've talked about this a little bit as well, um, you have to talk to your players before you even start because some players are not going to like this. If you have to be doing a homebrew world, uh, I think to do low fantasy gritty, you can't really do that in a D and D setting or a Pathfinder setting because it's already in there. The, the, the high level of magic is already embedded into um, those places that are in D and D, whether it's Greyhawk or the Sword Coast or wherever. Um, so if you do your own setting, um, as long as the players know it going in, then when you first start playing, you do it by the tone that you create when you're doing your very first session. It could be a cold, rainy day as the party sloshes through the mud and muck on the way to a small little town in the middle of nowhere. Um, and when they get there, everything is its just so sad. It's decrepit. Things are broken down. Nobody looks up when they walk past them on the street and those kind of things. It's that tone that you first start off with that, that they're going to say, whoa, this is, right. is going to be tough. Right. Absolutely. Another thing to look at, and I can only say this because this is part of the channel's it was part of the reason why I went to Gen Con was to meet all of these these game designers and that sort of thing. And I just happen to have a copy of it here. Is check out this Adventures in Middle Earth. It came out a while ago. Middle Earth is a low fantasy kind of setting. Yes, mm -hmm. there's orcs and there's elves and that sort of thing, but magic is very very limited in Middle Earth. They've got some nice ideas in here. They kind of give you a spell list of spells that are more likely to occur in Middle Earth than in, in regular D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. It is D&D &D 5th edition compatible. It's by Cubicle 7. So have a look at that. Uh, could be could be worth something to to, to, to to look at there. Spend a lot of time on that question because I think it was quite an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Okay, Philip John Ryan, or John Ryan Philip says, Thinking of a dramatic opening of my campaign involving a convoy of carts being attacked by a giant kin on their way to a fortress similar to Attack on Titan. How to make it highly... Uh, how to make a highly memorable encounter. Uh, what's attacking... Is it memorable giant or mobile? Kin? Both, really. <laughs> Sorry, the question... Your screen is growing fast. The, the, the question was going higher and higher and I was just reading the bottom of it. Uh, how to make a highly mobile encounter. Mm -hmm. Now, that's interesting. That's interesting. I think... Um, because we've been working on the book, which I will talk about on the hour, uh, but w since we've been working on the book, I, we've been looking at a lot of D&D &D rules for vehicle combat, for vehicle stuff. Um, and I think that your biggest challenge here is, as you say, how do you make it mobile without being too dangerous? If your players are going to be, if your characters anyway, are going to be standing on that cart as they're kind of rolling down the hills and things, think about the things that you could do to make the cart ride that much more terrifying. So as they're being chased by these giant kin, suddenly the road in front of them, they realize that the bridge has kind of given way and they're going to have to ramp over it. You don't want it to be this massive leap. But you don't want it to you don't want it to be an inch wide. You want it to maybe be a foot wide, so they have to build up speed and they have to ramp over it. Don't make it deadly. So in other words, they will ramp over it. If they don't make it, the wheel of the one wagon can get stuck. So that the player characters can still climb over to the other side mm -hmm. of the bridge and then maybe try and pull that wagon free before the giants arrive. Uh, just there's, there's so many, so many options that you can go with. Uh, in terms of don't just think about the monsters and their hit points. Think about think about the, the the carts themselves and what can the carts be used for? If they get overturned, will they act as a shield? Um, I think using the environment uh, in there is something that a lot of GMs don't utilize enough. Mm. Use the use the environment. Make it like a, a crazy roller coaster ride that the the giant's last boulder killed the the driver of the wagon and now the horses are running for their lives and the, the PCs are in the back of the cart hanging on for dear life trying to get up to the front to stop the horses um, those kind of things but make it make it an, an environment uh, yes. issue that there could be terrain issues there could be storms there could be all rock slides all kinds of different things that Absolutely. you can add to Absolutely. the to make it 
more interesting. Yes. And I think also make it affect both the giant kin and the wagons as well. So it's not just affecting the PCs, have them be taken out uh, by by bits and pieces. So I think that's also something definitely, definitely to keep in mind there. Um, okay. Okay, good. Right, next question. Breakfast Surreal. So many questions. This is awesome, guys. We've just reached over 100 people watching. Thank you. Yay. Great to have you all here. If you are new, we're going to be answering questions. We're going to be talking about Gen Con. We're going to be talking about uh, giving a name to this little guy here who's falling off my shoulder. I think he's falling asleep here. Um, so we're going to have to find out what's going on there. He likes um, me better. He likes you better. It's the purple. It's the purple. <laughs> um, so we're going to be giving him a name to him. And yes, if you are going to be asking a question, put the word question in front of your text first so we can see that in shay i see you've asked uh, is this for star wars of course it is it's all role playing we don't just look at dungeons and dragons although that is uh, a big thing everyone uh, i see there's another question what's on my shoulder what's on my shoulder is the only thing that i actually bought at gen con a little fluffy furry thing it's the closest i'm going to come to getting my dogs back i think um i don't have to feed it i don't have to bathe it i don't have to wash it i don't have to really do anything i can put it in a cupboard when it's naughty um i can just do all sorts of weird wonderful things i suppose um not sure if he likes that particularly um but anyway so yes this was what i got at gen con because i just couldn't resist it was so fluffy and furry i had to make it mine uh we're looking for a name from snuffle seems to be the one that is is, is coming up quite often anyway all right uh, we're gonna go let's do some more questions we go back to talk about gen con right um Stefan Stefan Roof Roof I'm not sure how to pronounce that tomorrow I'll be running a homebrew game for some friends and I've had a hard time heard hard time in the past with party dynamics is there anything I can do as a GM to help influence good party dynamics uh sure there are so many things that you can do Mike I'm gonna hand this over to you so I can get something to drink <laughs> jeez <laughs> Oh, party dynamics. That I think it all starts with a really good session zero. Um, expectations need to be laid for the players uh, and the GM. Uh, what you expect from the players, what the players expect from you, what kind of games that they want to have run, those kind of things. And just laying that groundwork at the session zero will allow for fewer instances of player disagreement and that kind of thing. Yep, I couldn't agree more. I also think that something that's definitely worth having a look at is trying to establish relationships between the parties as well. So it's not just a case of, oh, you all just get together to go hunting a monster, but uh, looking at things like um, you are best friends with this character, this character has a long lost love, or this one is doing this, or this one is doing that. So by doing that, mm -hmm. it could even just be the fact that you both went to the same garrison if there's if there's you know people fighting or, or whatever so um yeah i i would look at, at having some kind of historical connection if they don't have one already and and sort of putting that in and and, and playing around with that so uh, have a look at that uh, in the book complete campaign uh, in the um book the complete guide what is it called? I don't even remember. To creating epic campaign. To became, yeah, my own <laughs> bloody book. Brain. <laughs> la, um, it's been a long week today. It's been a long week today. Absolutely. Uh, in that book, I actually have a section where we talk about creating relationships between party members. And specifically, we talk about how it can enhance the role playing and put your players to the challenge. So there's actually three different categories of relationships uh, first one is work based so in other words the characters knew each other they both worked in the farm or in the mill or whatever the setting might be the second one is their friends sort of that kind of relationship and then the third one is actually familial relationships so brothers sisters mothers and that sort of thing so that that makes it it sort of ramps up the role playing challenges uh, for the players as well as 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 just creating bonds between the characters trevor ford says i'm creating a dungeon with a giant spirit tree what kind of entity would you recommend putting in the tree? Now, obviously, one goes sort of dryad or uh, something along those lines. You don't want to go there because that's what people expect. And you don't want a demented druid in there. A giant spirit tree. Hmm. You thinking something? Well, Trevor, you should look up the Golthias tree. Um, I've used a version of the Golthias tree in uh, a couple of my campaigns. Uh, the players seem to like it. Um, a vampire was basically the gist of it is a vampire was killed. 
uh, with a wooden stake through the heart, but the stake was green wood, meaning it was still alive. And yes, it, it kind of killed the vampire, but the, since the wood was still alive, it sucked in the blood and essence of whatever the vampire and became a vampiric tree. So that's i i love that i, I whenever i hear gold fires i'm like what is that oh yes it's the vampire tree how much how awesome could that be yes absolutely do that uh that's an option otherwise is the tree necessarily evil it's at the center of the dungeon perhaps the dungeon was built around the tree to contain it uh perhaps the tree wants to try and escape itself uh, whatever's in the tree just wants to be free wants to be out of there uh, so there's definitely some options there that you could look at as well. Um, Nefilfang, I see it's not, you didn't put question in the front, but I do see words that r r hit my eye, Ghost of Saltmarsh. Tomorrow, we return tomorrow. Everyone is back where they should be. Dead Aussie Game is back in Australia. Janet from World Anvil is back in the UK, and I'm back uh, with Mike here in uh, Minneapolis. So uh, go and get ready for tomorrow. We continue on the high seas. Three episodes left, and there's a major announcement in tomorrow's show so watch out for that i'm not going to give any spoilers away at all uh mark un un unvery uh, mark un unvery unvery oh there it goes let me scroll up a little bit quickly uh i'm planning uh, to run a campaign for my non-native english students in japan mark have we spoken i'm sure we should have spoken there's only like five people in japan who do role playing uh in english anyway um and you want to simplify it to adapt it to the students what key aspects should i retain in the campaign it's interesting that you say that i will be releasing a gm video next week called gms and cars which is where we talk about the role-playing game that Mike and I played whilst driving from Minneapolis to Indianapolis, which, although they're both Appalaces, uh, that's a, what was it, nine hours, nine and a half hour drive. Mm, so, about yeah, 10, yeah, we did some role-playing in the car where we basically used, it was, I don't even want to call it D&D Lite. Um, what am I doing? Oh, I'm pressing buttons, sorry. Um, I've got the controller on my waist and the screen's just going mad, opening up thousands of pages. Well, at least we're still on air. I hope. Um, thank you for that, uh, <laughs> Jonathan Thompson. We do appreciate that. We really do. Even though I've been, I'm, I'm doing some crazy stuff. Sorry, where was I? I was talking about. Um, uh, oh yeah, simple systems. <sighs> yes. So in that, Mike was driving, but he was also playing at the same time. So we didn't really want him to take his hands off the wheel to roll dice and that kind of stuff. And we didn't want the the, the overly complicated stuff. So we actually developed a very very simple kind of thing it I, it was not an, in any shape or form anywhere near dungeons and dragons fifth edition complex but it kind of did the job and i mean we role played for a good four or five hours straight mm -hmm. uh, and i think we got a pretty cool story out of it so uh yes watch out for that video next week otherwise drop me an email and we can chat if you are anywhere near tokyo we can maybe meet up sometime and and, and go through that because it's really exciting uh, sort of stuff to try and try and try and cover and I would love to meet any Japanese students who want to role play in English I really 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 would um, or Japanese I don't know if you're students actually um, at all right what are we doing for time uh, three more minutes so we're going to talk a little bit more about Gen Con I've got just a little bit of advice left um, before we, we move on uh, so Ak Akrima Sablosang Akrima Sablosang while established spellbooks are nice, do you think giving the players the choice to create their own custom ones while making their sheet and nerfing or changing it with them can work? It can. Take us through that, because I don't actually use spellbooks in my games. Well, I mean, we don't, we don't really use spellbooks. I mean, the, 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 the character would have a spellbook. Right. And they would know what spells are in it and that kind of thing. But if the, if the, player wants their character to have a custom spell yeah go for it oh yeah, yeah custom spell it. yes i think it's and, interesting uh, you know they can as long as it's something similar to another spell that's out there so you can determine what level spell that that should be um you know whether it's uh, an, an evocation spell or an, an illusion spell whatever um you can get all that done and just tell them okay we can we'll try this if it's way too overpowered or underpowered, we're going to adjust it later on. And as long as mm. they're cool with that, then they get their spell. Yep, I think that's a great idea. In terms of spell books, my, my wizards and things have spell books, but I generally don't pay too much attention, attention to it. I remember in second edition, 
advanced Dungeons and Dragons, when I was playing a, a wizard, you had to roll the number of pages that the spell was going to take in your spell book. And if your spell book didn't have enough pages, yeah, you're done. Uh, that's it. You you just couldn't write the spell into your spell book. You'd have to go and buy another one, and they cost a fortune. And uh, it, I, I felt it it really put a lot of pressure on the mage uh, that was unnecessary. The fighter didn't have to use a whetstone every day to sharpen their blades. So I thought it was, they should have. They should have. Sure, <laughs> in a, in an extreme kind of campaign where you're doing that. But uh, yeah, that low low fantasy gritty that, campaign. That's yeah, it. If you don't sharpen your sword, you're in trouble. You should get a blunt sword or, or something about <laughs> you get, that. So. You get tendonitis or something. <laughs> There we go. Tennis elbow from wielding your long sword for too long. All right, Mark. Yeah, drop me an email. Um, geekstable at gmail.com. Geekstable at gmail.com. I type it in, but I'm holding two things um, in my hands right now. So, uh, right. I think that's 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 some good questions. Um, Kelmia. Oh, uh, no, hang on. Wait a minute. Uh, Honorable596. Lots of questions from Honorable596. I like those. Can you see Sable Dice running a season in using one of the Warhammer role-playing games? That's going to be interesting. I'm not sure where Sable Dice is going uh, after the um, Oasis. I can't wait for it, for Oasis to finish. I, It's driving me nuts trying to figure out this Oasis campaign. It really is nice and complex. Um, and I think that that yes, it, uh, it, it, it I, I, I can't wait for the ending. I'm like, I want to know what happens. That's probably why I make a better GM than a player, because then at least I know the end before I get there. I just don't know how we're going to get there. Um, okay. All right. Let's talk about Gen Con a little bit more. Uh, did you have any advice off the top of your head, um, Mike, that you can think of? Uh, don't overschedule yourself, right, um, because yeah. we talked about how it takes... You know, at least 20 minutes to get somewhere getting food is ridiculous uh for time um but from everything that i had read up until uh, we left was more about you know only schedule two or three things um, a day because there's going to be a lot of people that you want to meet with um to go hang out with you're going to want to be playing games you're going to be uh wanting to go to the dealer hall all of those kind of things that are just going to fill up the whole rest of the day. That's it. I would also advise that if you are going to go to Gen Con next year, uh, hit the hit the vendor floor. It's massive. What, 570-something vendors were selling stuff? What blew my mind was that there was no... Um, it didn't feel like every third booth was the same. Yes, there was lots of dice. Yes, there was lots of of craziness uh, going on, but each one seemed to have its own feeling. So it didn't feel like you were seeing the same one and the same one and the same one. That was my takeaway anyway. Well, there were some of them that were the same. You know, there were, what, three or four different Chessex booths, okay, for yes, example. Okay, yes, yes, yes. But yeah, there were, there's uh, so much to look at. My problem that, that I think I had with the dealer hall was that the really cool items were also uber expensive. Mm. Um, and then it seemed like most everything else was the common stuff that you could go to any game store, uh, and, and get, you know, the Chessex dice, you know, you can get those at any game store. Uh, you can order them online. Um, when I was going through the dealer hall in my head anyway, I thought, okay, if you have this particular book, for example, um, why am I going to buy it here? and lug it around in my backpack for the next uh, eight hours when I can just wait till I get home, order it online, go to the bookstore, go to the game store and get it there. Uh, mm. That just made mm. more, especially for the heavy, the bigger heavy things. Right. You know, Absolutely. A, a set of dice is, is no big deal, but um, you know, a b couple of two, three, four big heavy books. books and Different story. Yeah. Uh, KR Alucard, thank you for that donation. You are our new monster to beat tonight. You can guarantee that whatever gets raised on Super Chat or Bits will be going to buying Mike several cake pieces, uh, slices, cake slices. No, they won't. I, I don't I don't give the cake to anyone. I, I always eat it myself. The cake is a lie. Anyway. The cake is a lie. Anyway, <laughs> there we go. All right. Uh, last thing for Gen Con, I would always say browse the dealer hall first. Have a look at what's there. And there's, there's so much stuff there. Have a look what's there and then wait until Sunday. Unless it's stuff that they're going to run out of. And usually they say, oh, we only sell 10 of these a day or 20 of these a day or, or whatever. Um, but I did notice on Sunday that there were some things that they had slashed prices for because remember these guys are carting the stuff out there 
and whatever they don't sell, they have to take it back. Mm-hmm. Uh, so sometimes I didn't, I didn't see a lot of those kind of deals oh, okay. on yeah. Sunday I've, myself, but there were a couple others in the group that you know they, they were just like here, take this and right, right, know. absolutely, mm-hmm. um, yes. Okay, let's. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, just try and get a hotel closer and don't get a hotel that's being torn down uh, on the day that you are checking out because that makes things awkward. Uh, and if we won't say any more than that. Right. Um, I do see DJ Down Under. Shame has been asking the same question since the beginning of the stream. Uh, I will get to your question now, DJ. Uh, so so hang on for that. Uh, first, I've got to go to AK Writer. It's gone. I knew it was there and then it moved away. AK Writer says, can you explain Gen Con to someone who has never been there or seen something remotely like it? Lots of people, 70,000 geeks wandering around in costume, in in absolute chaos. It takes over an, an international convention center, which is a big international convention center. It took over your football stadium. Yep. It took over four hotels. It's just thousands of people for four There's at days. Least six hotels. Have yeah, six over. hotels. Uh, I believe that Indianapolis has thirty-three thousand hotel rooms, and they were all fully booked. So um, it is also. I have to say, it was very friendly and smiley. I see Adrian also talking about that. Mm-hmm. Um, people were chatty you'd sort of make a comment and four people would turn around and smile and and talk about it as well so i thought that was really awesome Mm -hmm. um yeah i i kind of like that uh very much everything is ticketed so what you do is you you go online months before the convention starts and you you create a profile and you start buying tickets for stuff um so definitely definitely something to to bear in mind buy tickets um we were running two seminars mike was helping me and we had to collect tickets at the door uh to to hand over to the convention because they that's how they they operate and um yeah we got 90 people in both events so that was that was pretty awesome and Mm -hmm. of the 90 80 odd were booked for the session and then seven were what were called generic uh tickets but if you if the venue is full you can't use a generic ticket so uh yeah it's just absolute chaos there's board games going there's role playing going there's larping there's cosplay there's everything that you would expect from a convention just on a scale I have never seen before. And I mean, I, I've done a lot of these. So, Yeah, and to get back to the dealer hall for just a second, yes. you know, pick a day to go to the dealer hall or, you know, tr- you cannot get through that dealer hall in one day. No, you can't. You can't. There's too many people. It's you, too slow. I mean, mm. if there was nobody else in the dealer hall, oh, sure, you could probably do it. <laughs> but with that many other geeks, nerds, dweebs, cosplayers, um, you know, you're not getting through there in a day. Um, just going down one of those rows on Thursday, I mean, God, it was more than a half an hour just going down one row. And there's... That's it. There's how many row? God, there was... There like, was... Well, it went from one, uh, from 100. Each row was a, a value of 100, yeah. and it went up to two to 3,000. Yeah. So you do the math. Yeah. So there's there's 30 rows, and if that's you can right. only get down one of them in a half an hour... That's it. That's, That's it. a long day. Um, I see. Just while we're on the convention still, um, Adrian uh, says, did you avoid convention crud? Yes, we yep. did. Mike, very wisely, about a week beforehand. I think it was about a week beforehand. We went and bought vitamins. And for the week before... We got vitamins, too. <laughs> <laughs> vitamin vitamin tomato tomato router router yes uh whatever we we got the things that contain the things all the chemicals um we got massive amounts of vitamins and just took those every day before we got there whilst we were there i'm still taking them but yeah i don't think anyone in our troop got them got con so. con crud which is quite nice con crud for those of you that don't know is generally because there's so many people wandering around Lots of them live in basements, so when they do surface, there are diseases spread like you can't believe. So, yes. Um, well, I think a lot of it is, you know, if you're going to go to the dealer hall and you're going to touch demo this yeah. board game, then that that little piece on the board has already been touched by, you know, 20, 30 people. That's it. So That's it. That's it. So I just didn't touch anybody while I was there. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. Yep. Lots of vitamin C and all that kind of stuff. There we go. 
Uh, and of course, I've lost the D DJ's question. He was asking a question about steampunk, which I thought was quite interesting. I'm going to go find it because we're going to talk about something else just now. Uh, there we go. All right. So DJ down under 757 has been asking. He's writing or is writing a light, a lit RPG. What's a lit RPG? Do you know? I think it's it's a literary. I think it's like a story based on an RPG, a literary RPG. Okay. I could be wrong. Okay. Explain to us what a lit RPG is and in, 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 in give us insight uh, into which you play as a regular sapper. Okay. It's okay. Not, not just a regular novel then. Right, right. As a regular sapper in a steampunk military. Okay. Steampunk is always cool. How to grow and showcase this character so that the player cares while it's essentially railroaded. That's a very big question uh, in terms of all of that. Getting people to care. Getting people to care. I think that's... How do you get people to care about a character? I did a whole series of videos on these, by the way. It's called How to Get Your Players to Invest in NPCs and, and Buildings and Locations and all that kind of stuff. It's a, it is very complicated, uh, DJ. And I think the most important thing is, is why do we care about anybody? Why do you care about the people in your life? And I hate to say it, but, oh, Lone Wolf series. Oh, okay. Well, that makes it a little bit more interesting. Okay. So, uh, right. Lone Wolf, of course, is, is a Choose Your Own Adventure series, which he also novelized. Um, Joe Diva uh, wrote the Lone Wolf series. A very fun series of Choose Your Own Adventure books. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed them. Um, yeah, so, you know, why do we like people? And uh, this has been on the channel before in terms of, of likability. Are they proactive? Um, are, they, are they just generally nice or are they depressed? Um, what was it? It's proactivity, likability, and, oh, are they actually capable? So proficiency, are they actually capable of doing what they're doing? So if you create a character who is who's got all three, they become a little bit of a goody two-shoes, but at the same time, when they fail to live up to their own standards, that's generally when we start to like people. So something to have a look at there. Go and look for that video on YouTube. I would say YouTube. make sure that they're consistent as well. Yes, yes. Well, they're consistent up until they fail. Yeah, they, you may or may not like the character, but they're consistent, so you can you yes. have this expectation. There we go. Look at Sherlock Holmes, for example. He's not a very likable <laughs> character. He's not... Uh, proactive he waits until a crime comes to him and when he doesn't get a crime he does cocaine until he becomes clean of that addiction in the entire storyline mm -hmm. so he's not proactive and although he's very 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 professional the other two are, are definitely failures but we still generally start to like him after a while because he's consistent in that and his reasoning for do it doing it seems 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 pretty good uh, right, Cole Soak says, I uh, heard you met Seth Skorkowski at Gen Con. It sounds amazing. Seth is an amazing guy. Did you see, did you meet Seth? No, sadly. Um, I wasn't invited. <laughs> no, this is this is another point about Gen Con is that if you go with the group, so there were six of us that, mm -hmm. that basically we stayed in the same hotel, we went down together, we, we hung out together as often as we could, and we tried to use WhatsApp and uh, not WhatsApp, uh, Messenger and, and, and that sort of thing to stay in touch. But so often, especially because it was our first con, it would be, hey, where are you guys? I'm at the thing. And you'd go, well, where the hell is the thing? Oh, no, I've moved from the thing now, and now I'm in another thing. And you go, okay, well, it's going to take me four days just to get from here to there. So you go do your thing. We're going to go do our thing or whatever. Seth was an amazing, is, an, is an amazing YouTuber. He won his gold any for, for his channel, for podcasts, I think, which was absolutely awesome because he puts in so much work. Um, yes, we met and, and hung out and he tried to get me to commit major street crimes, um, which was, <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I didn't commit any street crimes, but I did take a photograph of myself on a scooter and that's all I'm going to say about You will only say that you did not do that on live. <laughs> right. <laughs> Something that's going to be recorded for eternity. Right. Uh, yes. I did not do that. I did not do that. I definitely did not. So yes, now that was absolutely a lot of fun uh, to meet up with Seth Skorkowski. And, and, and chill and, and hang out. And I wish I could have spent more time with him, but it, our, our timeline's just split and went in different directions. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, met me by the giant Pikachu. Yeah, there was a giant Pikachu. Got to get pictures of that. That was that was a lot of fun. Pasta news. Thank you for your kind commentary. Uh, I do appreciate it, and I'm glad that the videos have helped. Uh, I don't want to th ask the question. Have we run out of questions? 
Uh, Sabretooth, you heard that Seth got me to jaywalk. How did you, how did you hear these things? He must have told you. Uh, yes, he did. He got me to jaywalk. You don't jaywalk in Japan. You just don't. You, well, you don't commit any crimes in Japan. You really, 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 really don't want to commit any crimes in Japan. So, uh, yes, he got me to jaywalk. He's like, come on, let's just go. And I was like, but Seth, that's a crime. He's like, be free. Embrace yourself. Just run. Run, fat boy, run. And he's like, okay, I'm running. It was so much fun. Uh, it, it was really cool. Um, so, yes, I think that for me, and I, I you know, this is something that I, I'm not... Uh, I don't mind talking about it, but it is one of the privileges, I think, of being a YouTuber is that you can, you can get to meet people like Seth Skorkowski. And I met with Nate from WSD20, and he's such a tall, such a cool guy. Uh, we got to hang out with him. And, of course, the Nerdarchy team, well, the whole Save or Dice team crowd was there. Mm -hmm. Satine Phoenix was there as well. So, so yeah. And I got to meet two cool, cool people, too. That's right. John Wick. That's right. Um, not the one you're thinking of. The not, other not one. The, not the movie no one. one knows about. I keep telling everybody, read a book. Um, <laughs> no, John Wick uh, did a couple of really good books, um, Play Dirty and Play Dirty 2. If you want to really up your, your GM game, get those two books. They are absolutely amazing. Uh, he also wrote uh, Seventh Sea. Uh, okay. He wrote Wicked Fantasy. Um, so John Wick was very cool to meet. Um, the, the people that you mentioned, I didn't get to meet Satine. Um, no, I only bumped into it at this bizarre party at midnight. Yeah. yeah. I got to meet Cat Rambo, which is another good uh, author. I got to meet her, and I got to meet Robin D. Laws. Um, yeah, so there was lots of lots of cool people. It's 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 funny where you're just wandering around in the dealer hall or you're hanging out by a food truck and there's somebody that you've been watching on YouTube or reading their books and you're like, "Hey, cool. I know you." Oh, I wrote Rudy Rutenberg. Rudy Rutenberg, uh, that's right. I did. I was Bill supposed Allen, to. Bill Allen, yep. uh, another YouTuber. Yep. So got to meet lots of cool people. And I think the other thing is a lot of people are very nervous to come and say hello. And they sort of go, is that so-and-so? Is that so-and-so? They're not sure. And I, I don't know of a single YouTuber that we met this this past weekend who was, who was going, oh, I hate meeting fans. I wish they would stop talking to me. Everyone was like, oh, I've got... Mm -hmm. I love meeting fans. I love meeting fans. I don't remember names because I'm very bad at names, but I think we uh, we do the YouTube stuff primarily because it helps people like yourselves. It helps the fans. And so if the fans come forward and say, hey, you're helping me, uh, you know, that helps encourage us to, to do more. So mm -hmm. so there we go. Uh, DJ Down Under, Down Under, farewell. I'm, I'm, thanks for the answers. Hopefully it'll, it'll help you. Um, yeah, just think about why we should like them, why we should like them. Um, so, so there we go. All uh, right, and I know Seth just had a live stream. When is since when is Seth doing live streams? I don't. I I I hope it was. I I I wish I could have seen it. I will go and look for it uh, later on. Uh, right. Um, it is the hour. It is the hour. So we're going to talk about something important, relatively important. It's important to me, and hopefully it'll be important to you. It's important to Mike too, because um, he's he's heavily involved in it. And uh, last time we were talking about the book. So hold your questions for now. Hold your questions for now. Uh, we will come back to questions. I see there's some questions. Jonathan Thompson asking about Shadowrun. I haven't ever played Shadowrun. Have you played Shadowrun? Mm -mm. But I have played Cyberpunk games and I've played D20 modern games and things that are very similar. So so Jonathan, go ahead and ask your questions. Shadowrun 2 was released at Gen Con. I don't think it was 2. I think it was 6. 6. Because right. Didn't yes, that's Eric right. and yes. Tyler. So the two guys that were with us, Eric and Tyler, Tyler, they went to go and try and play Shadowrun Six, and their experience was a bit mixed because of the person running the game for them. So, um, but yes. Yeah, so hold your questions for now. Hold your f questions for now. Um, AK writer, are we going to come for something in Germany, such as Spiel? I would love to go to Spiel um, in Germany. I think that would be absolutely mind blowing. So get Spiel to invite us, and we'll definitely go. Um, because you know why not? And Austria, of course, Austria's home of Dungeon Fog. My 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 big long time friend. So I would love to go to Austria to watch this space. Europe may be next. Who knows? Okay, so we were talking about the book two weeks ago, the book that I'm writing, The Complete Guide to uh, Creating Nautical Campaigns. We showed you some book covers. We asked you to vote on which book covers you like the most. And I went to Gen Con and I attended a seminar on designing book covers, what you should look for and what you shouldn't look for. And we finally settled on a look that we think 
is going to be pretty, pretty awesome. So have a look. This is the new book cover. I'm hoping that you like it. I think it's similar to what you've seen before, but there's lots more color. We neatened it up. We moved some stuff around. Um, it's got the little uh, 5e compatible logo that we created for it because it is for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Um, but this really is, from from what we can what we can do, say, the very best complete guide to nautical campaigns. 25 ships. There's rules on how to create giant undead or how to create giant sea monsters we're talking creatures that are three four hundred foot long that have got multiple points of armor class and attack hit points and that kind of stuff we're talking aircraft carriers um we're talking pegasus squadrons there's squadron combat there's fleet combat there's rules for uh admiral controlling a massive fleet um yeah, so so I think it's it's about as comprehensive as we can get. Now we've had some difficulties on that, and if you will permit, if you will permit, dear viewers, because I know we're here for your questions, but if you'll let us wax lyrical a little bit, I'm going to stop hiding Mike now. Um, are you are you, you done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly um so if you will permit us if you will permit us i'd like to talk a little bit about the journey that this book has been on because if you head on over and let me just do that now because i've got it set up here we go um no i did not i thought i had there you can see all the text just flying through but let's go here if you head on over uh to our website and of course there's project deos we were talking about that a little bit earlier on you can learn more about project deos and that wonderful kickstarter but i'm gonna let it i'm not gonna let it it's scroll through one. i'm gonna go to there there you can see the book in a rough kind of of layout and it is on pre-sale now, this pre-sale, and I'm not trying to sell you on the book. If you're going to get the book, I would suggest you do the pre-sale. Why? Because the pre-sale is at the price. It is 150 pages long or thereabouts. Um, and as you can see, there's stats for ships. There are, and it's not just stats for ships. It's deck layouts. It's ship names. So here, for example, each ship class of the 27 gets a, there's a ship name there's a captain there's a first officer there's a quartermaster there's a bosun so you get a whole bunch of things there it's obviously filled with with cool art these are called uh, um puranox uh, which are little piranha like creatures they kind of like cobbles for the sea then there's actually sea bowls which feature in in ghost of salt marsh uh so so the book is finished in terms of writing mike is still editing it mike is the editor of the book um but not just any editor you are the developmental editor sure <laughs> is, it, is it developmental it, it is, is developmental yes. what's a developmental editor talk to us well, there's regular copyright editors that basically just check spelling and uh, grammar, sentence structure, that kind of stuff. And then a developmental editor does all of those things, plus they also do uh, special things with the mechanics um, to make sure that those are all correct. They move things around if need be um, to make sure things flow a little better. Um, they're just... They're just like an editor on steroids. Yes, basically, oh, massive, you know, they massive, they will they will help guide and and direct the author. You know, say, hey, look at this closer. You might want to totally redo this section because it doesn't make sense. Correct. Um, and then we'll go through and re-edit it again. Yes. So, um, and we have been doing a lot of that. You know, it, it's it's it's. Um, yeah, the idea is is there's lots of mechanics in here and we check them and we test them. So things like things that fifth edition don't have. Fifth editions do not fifth edition does not have rules for sinking. Mm -hmm. They don't have rules for sinking. So Mike and I battled backwards <laughs> and forwards. Spent hours. It's like how <laughs> do we do rules for sinking? Because I wanted it to fit with what fifth edition was doing. And then, um, 
Mike was going, well, yes, but this doesn't make sense and this doesn't make sense. Let's do it as a percentage. Let's do it as a this. Let's do it as a that. So there was lots of battling going on backwards and forwards. Always good natured. I don't think at and then any point, And then play testing. And then play testing. And then revising. And That's then play right. testing again. And <laughs> That's right. And and revising and play testing. And, and it's, been, it's been an absolute journey. So the book is finished being mm-hmm. written. What is not yet finished is the artwork inside the book. So I'm going to go back there because I want to show you what, what, we, what we're talking about. So the whole idea of the pre-sale is that the PDF is done in terms of the 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 information. Let's put it the that words. way. And the words. The words. The, words, the, words, the, the things I don't have. The words are done. <laughs> what is not done is every single ship, like I said, is going to get a deck plan. This is actually a deck map. Obviously, if you know Dungeon Fog, you'll recognize that I've been using that. They get a deck plan, but also we wanted every ship to have its own illustration. That's this little ship here. So this is a Brigantine. So that's an illustration I pulled off of the web. But Brigantine is probably the most normal of the ships. We have got aquatic ships in there. So that's ships that sail underwater for kobolds, merfolk, uh, Sahaugen have got giant manta rays with these big controller collars on them. So we wanted illustrations and stuff to, to, to populate this thing. And when you start looking at the cost of illustrations and things, it, it becomes very, very heavy. And so we said, well, look, let's do a pre-sale because we're not sure. There is always what they call imposter doubt where it's like, oh, I don't know if anyone wants to buy the book and that kind of stuff. So when it comes to character art and that sort of thing, that that is the usual stuff that we can do. Um, but the ship art is just stuff that I wanted to look really cool. And when you talk about a dwarvish ship... There's one called the Thordane class, which is this massive warship with trebuchets on it and battlements. It's basically a floating fortress. That is an illustration that we want to have and we want to put in there. So we're trying to raise as much money on the pre-sale as we can to increase the quality of the artwork within the book, if that kind of makes sense. So if we didn't want artwork, we could put the book out tomorrow. The other thing is with the pre-sale. Well, not tomorrow. I still, well, not tomorrow. Yeah. I still okay. have more so to there's, edit. There's, there's some more, <laughs> some, some more editing going on. But yes, um, the pre-sale is pretty good because it, it, the price is obviously eleven ninety nine. Once the artwork is in, that will sh- that will I don't want to say shoot up. But that'll go up to fourteen ninety nine. Um, anyway, so if you have someone who likes running nautical campaigns, there it is. It's something for you to to have a look at uh, and go and, and jump on that. Um, the web goblin is 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 ready and waiting. Uh, for for all of those, uh, I think somebody was asking the question if I was the web goblin. You're the I'm OBS not. goblin. I'm not. Yeah, you are the OBS goblin. Yeah. Um, so uh, yes, any more questions? Uh, Ethan Bascom, you did not miss creative writing. That is coming up in 19 minutes. It'll come up on the half hour. Um, uh, AK writer says, when you wrote that book, did you consult someone who actually does go sailing and knows this stuff? It's a very good question, um, AK Writer. And I think the important thing is there was a vast amount of research that was done in terms of this. We have been looking at how high is a crow's nest from the deck of a ship? How high are the masts for a 100-foot sailing ship? What is the the average crew complement of ships and things? And, of course, the biggest challenge is that when you start looking at these kinds of ships... There are other things that come into mind that we can't refer to people who who have uh, sailing knowledge because they'd look at you and they'd go, well, that's a dumb question. For example, we have lots of aircraft carriers. And by aircraft carriers, I mean Pegasus carriers and giant eagle carriers and giant bat carriers and giant octopus carriers and giant seahorse carriers. We've got big ships in there that launch these things out because in my thinking... If I was in a fantasy world, that's what I would be using as my my squadrons. I'd, I'd send them out to go and attack ships and drop stuff on and all sorts of things. I'm going to cough. I've got something in my throat. Um, but yes, we have been doing a vast amount of research. Uh, if you recall, I did some walkabouts on several wooden sailing ships and on the HMS, not the HMS, <laughs> the USS Midway, which is an aircraft carrier where a lot of information came from. Mm-hmm. Uh, excuse me, uh, Mike. Talk about the nautical terms. How we've included some and not not others. Yeah, ba- the basic. You don't want to overdo everything. Um, my father was a sailor, so I knew some of these terms. You know, port, starboard. You know, all that kind of stuff. The jib and the keel and. Um, 
what I think Guy was trying to do in the book is to give enough examples of nautical terminology to make it real for players that have maybe never even been on a boat, but not so many terms and and definitions of different things mm. that it becomes <clears throat> overwhelming. And then you're like, well, wait a minute. What, the, what was that third rope on the second thing supposed to, what was that? Sp- you, that's just too much. Mm. That's just too much. So I think there was what, probably about a two thirds of a page maybe of different yeah. terms, just different terms you can yeah. add in and, and keep or not keep. Or uh, <clears throat> Yeah. And it's about the experience as well. As you say, you don't want to go in too far. Um, but where possible, uh, and we have had these debates, it's like, all right, how much food do you need to consume on a monthly basis mm-hmm. as a sailor? And we've sat there working it out in pounds, and then you take the pounds weight and you convert it into gold and, and, and all those kinds of things. So uh, it, it's yeah. the normal GM stuff that we do when you're talking about world building or you know, story building, whatever. And as a GM, you just go down this rabbit hole. And so, you know, we were even doing stuff today with the book where we were like, okay, if the, if you have somebody and they want to transport four ducks and three goats and two two cows cows and an ox, how much is that going to cost them? Is the farmer going to likely to go with them on the journey to sell his livestock someplace else? And how much is the farmer going to make? And and it's just that's how deep and into this rabbit hole we get with this book it's pretty amazing and it's all so that you don't have to so that when your players say uh can we transport five tons of gold or can we transport five tons of steel or cotton or whatever how much profit we're going to make all those kind of answers are in there Mm -hmm. so there we are all right that's more than enough from us this is not a sales (laughs) channel because if you buy now you'll get an entire collection no you won't but Um, wait there's more (laughs) there's more that's right earl what's more (laughs) You get pretty pictures, too. Pretty <laughs> pictures. That's right. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, what about bugs in the food supply? It's there. It uh, encounters at sea. It's there. There's all kinds of things that are, are included. And lots of GM advice, of course, as well, because that's what we do on the channel. So um, mm-hmm. each each section has what we call a GM sidebar. And that sidebar is, okay, so this section was talking about harbors. What's the sidebar in terms of how do you as the game master then incorporate that into your game? What are some adventure options that you can look at? What are some things you can think about? Why would you include these? Why wouldn't you include those those kinds of things? So I think uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's rules and it's advice and it's insight and it's inspirational. And, and I, I, that's why we wrote it because it, it, it's, it's been a long time in, in, in coming. All right, back to questions. Um, do you include a recipe for hardtack? Says Jack Linda. No, we didn't, but we did debate rum consumption. Uh, a there wasn't lot. a whole lot of debate about the rum consumption. No, there wasn't a lot of debate. Would you like some rum, my sir? Yes, there we yes. go. Not so much of a debate. Um, but yes, um, so, so there we go. Hardtack is probably just flour and water. Uh, yes. For the most part. For the most part, flour, water, and possibly some meat gruel uh, sometimes thrown in there as well, depending. Uh, you can actually make it out of. Uh, although it wouldn't be necessarily appropriate bearing in mind of of course as well that a lot of the nautical stuff that we think about when we talk about um nautical stuff is we tend to think about the age of sail the 17 and 1800s which is technically not fantasy setting for D&D. that's usually a little bit earlier where the ships didn't sail for as long but we've included a whole bunch of stuff as best we as best we can are you making notes I wrote a note to include a hardtack recipe, so <laughs> I'll see if I can find one for you, Jack, and we'll, we'll find a place to put that. There you go, Jack. As check a, out the book. A piece of artwork out. or something. Yeah, we'll rye flour I see is going in there, so yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go back to questions from you guys. If you've got questions, um, definitely ask them in the chat. We'll, we'll, we'll try and answer them as best we can. Creative writing will take place on the half hour, and it is a tough one. Tonight, it is definitely a tough one tonight. We're still waiting. We're still looking for cool names for this little guy on my shoulder. Um, we've had Snuffles so far. What was the other one that we had? I, I forget now. Snuffles seems to be the one. Uh, yes, we're trying to name it on the stream. So He looks like a booger. 
You just call him Booger. Oh, dear Lord. Uh, help. Um, yes. Uh, so, so write some questions. Jean Valero, many ways. 2017 at Hotmail.com says, What do you think of having multiple stories set concurrently with smaller parties and having them cross over? I'm trying that with three parties now and have found it interesting. Jean, I have done that myself. Um, not with three parties, with two parties set in my, my same world. And I have to say it was a tremendous amount of fun trying to keep track of things. What did become frustrating was when one of the parties killed the god of color and joy. And so the world went into black and white. It got crazy. Don't even ask. The other guys showed up at the table and I'm like, oh, by the way, the world is in black and white. They didn't really know what to do with that. Uh, so sometimes it can it can co uh, you know uh, clash and, and and cause things like that. But yes, it was definitely a lot of fun in terms of running the storylines. Uh, another thing just to help you so that you don't necessarily get crossed over is that um, when I was running the the uh, Braxia campaign, um, I'm actually still in the middle of a game with two players where they're playing the exact opposite. So they're playing the Rax Drakari, they're fighting against the good guys, basically. And that actually allowed me some very interesting insight into, well, if this is what the bad guys are doing, this is a position for the good guys, and if this is what the good guys are doing, how do the bad guys respond? So that was actually pretty interesting uh, from, from helping create very dynamic kind of spaces. Mike, have you ever done a multi-party kind of journey in the same, same world? Um... Well, yes, but it was two different groups and they were actually running uh, the same story. One uh -huh. of the groups was going, they had started earlier and so they were further along in the, the story um, than the, the second group, which made prepping much easier. Um, just a few different tweaks based on the individual characters in the, the other setting or their backstories and that kind of thing. But the general following of the story was the same, so that made prep really easy. There we but go. I didn't ever have two different, two different people or two different groups running in a different spot yes. of the world kind of deal. Okay. Some cool names coming through. Shelgar, Snark. I quite like Snark. Um, Jareth. Yes, David Bowie's Goblin King. Um, and I see someone asked, they found a, a, a video, of course you did, uh, on the ship's biscuit. Permission to share the link. Grizzlis, go for it. Share the link and I'll try and copy and paste it into YouTube for everyone to have a look at there as well. Uh, Angus Boy says, if you, were going, if you were going to, how would you go about switching from a land campaign to a naval campaign and back to a land campaign? Well, I... Not to drive this into too great a, a point here, uh, Angus, but that's what we've done with the, the Nautical Campaigns book, is that you, you do not have to play a class that is a captain class or a first officer class or a ship's bosun class. You can be a ranger who walks onto the ship and use that ship's abilities very well. We've given the, 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 the different roles on the ship different skill options, different orders that they can give, basically, based on things like survival and, and persuasion and deception and those sort of things. So that's, a, that's, that's what we have focused on, is how to do it so that it doesn't feel like, okay, I have to make my, my ship's captain character and now I have to make my land ranger character because they're so different. So mm -hmm. I think the, 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 the biggest thing is to make sure that you don't penalize the, the, the PCs for lacking skills that you think they should have. So if your land campaign, they should have tracking and they should have um, s stealth abilities and that sort of thing. When they then get onto the ship, don't I, I, try and create inventive ways of using the skills that they do have to to control the vessel and that kind of thing, rather than saying, well, you, you don't have survival, you don't know where you are on the ocean. Maybe use a religion check or a knowledge, or a history check or a, a arcana check, I suppose, to read the star, you know, so, so try and be more inventive in terms of the skill checks that you're asking for so that the players don't walk away going, well, if I'd known we were gonna be doing this, I would do that. If I'd known this, we would do that. 
so that would be my advice. Anything from you? I think. Well, I just I just really like that idea of of going from land to sea to land. To me, that just says that this is a really long campaign. You know, you you read online about these people, these groups that have been playing together for decades. You know, 30, 40 years they've been playing together, and that's how you can keep long running games interesting you start you do things on land blah 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 eventually they have to do stuff at sea and then they go back to land and then as they get higher levels now you're bouncing between different planes and all that kind of stuff just to keep things more fresh and interesting in a very long-term campaign yeah absolutely uh yes so pasta noodle says is it okay to be influenced by tv shows or to take influence mm-hmm. i have to say emphatically yes it yep. is it's about how pre- you present it in your world though don't take them directly but look at look at the character or the thing from the tv show that you want to to take into your game and then figure out how to incorporate it in a way that feels as if it's part of that space for example and i think this is a, a very dramatic kind of one let's say you want to incorporate Incorporate um, starships into a fantasy game. What is a starship? A starship is a vehicle. Uh, Terranatum, great, welcome. Thank you uh, for joining up. Uh, nice to see you here again. Uh, you would take that starship and you'd say, well, a starship is a vehicle for moving between worlds. But it's also something that can be attacked. It can You can have lots of experiences on it. So how would I translate that into a fantasy space? Well, perhaps you have these teleportation circles that teleport you onto these large uh, space-type creatures where there are mobile cities in that space. It's not necessarily sci-fi. It's magic, I suppose. But you could translate it across that way. You could have sort of space dragons and the like if you want to. Of course, you could always just go to Spelljammer. That's exactly what that did. So I think it's about trying to figure out how to include that in a way that fits within your campaign. And, of course, changing the name to suit. Um, in Karos Stones, uh, the fans were were uh, talking about a particular situation that had been set up that felt very much like a talk show. And um, I was struck by madness or inspiration to have the NPC villain turn into Jerry Springer, but we changed his name to Jara uh, Spranger. And so Jara Spranger was was conducting this interrogation of the PCs as if it was a Jerry Springer show. People loved it. We weren't playing a particularly serious game, but then again, um, it was a lot of laughs. So yes, I definitely think that you can do that without a doubt. Uh, Bernie Von Beam says, I want to create a series of utility magic items that the players use in odd creative ways. Do you have suggestions on what type of elements in the world to let them mess with? Utility magic items are always fun. Mm-hmm. Mike, any, any thoughts? I have a lot of creative players um, at my table. And I've always told them, as long as what you want to do kind of makes logical sense you can go ahead and do it and they've had some some pretty creative ways to use different magic items you know creating booby traps um you know just not the necessarily intended uh, purpose of the the magic item they use it in some unique creative way and i think it's it's great you could use all the different elements um whether it's fire or ice or whatever, I think that's kind of what the question was, um, uh, to use those magic items in, in new and interesting, interesting mm-hmm. ways. And, and as long as it's, as long as it's somewhat logical, I mean, let's face it, we're all playing in worlds where magic and dragons and elves exist. So eh, if it's kind of close and makes sense, I'd just let them do it. There we go. Um, I think it's also about applying conditions and things, saying, well, uh, for example, the other day we were, we were playtesting the book's rules and Mike was, uh, your character, you were playing a wizard. No, what was your character class? No, it was a cleric. You were a cleric. The last right. time we played, That's I was right. playing a cleric. You were a cleric and you were on board this vessel. You were the surgeon mm-hmm. on the ship. But the, 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 the ship had hit doldrums, they, the, which is a calming space. There's no wind and they were on a sailing ship. So you wanted to use 
uh, not gust of wind. Yep. It was a gust of wind. Yep. It's a it's a cleric spell. Cleric spell. That's right. Gust of, gust of wind, and basically it's supposed to be used against uh, Anyways, an opponent, put, mm. and you're basically just pushing them away using a, a wall of of wind. Correct. And I asked guy in the games like, well, okay, if can I use this on the sails? Yes. Not against a creature or an opponent, but against the sails to to try and help move the ship forward. That's right. Um, so yeah. Yeah, and what I did there was because technically it 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 wasn't designed for that. The spell wasn't designed for that. Um, we said, okay, well, what are the, what are the parameters of the spell? And the spell said, well, if the if the target fails its strength check, uh, it gets pushed. So we said, all right, well, the ship's got a strength score. It can fail strength check. So let's let's give it a roll. If it fails it, what it does is it's not the ship actually physically failing the strength check. It means the spell has enough effect to cause the ship to move which which as we did we rolled it in the mm -hmm. ship gained 15 foot of movement for that particular round mm -hmm. which i think allowed you to us to outrun the one ship but then catch up with the merchant ship and do some some cool stuff but yeah i think it's about looking at what spells and things they're going to be using we'll look at what kind of magical item effects we'll be having uh, and sometimes applying them onto that i know that's a very long roundabout answer mm -hmm. but there you go yeah it doesn't that's it doesn't have to be items it could be spells um, it doesn't have to be any kind of magical item either. Right. It can be an ordinary, you know, walking stick, you know, so just done differently. Yep. Last question before we go into creative writing. I see there's some, uh, Sid Steels. Thank you for your very kind comments there. Um, yes, Terran Artem, you missed the Gen Con discussion for the first hour. We were talking about Gen Con. Uh, it was a lot of fun to, to, to go with. Uh, so the last question, Colin Duff says, how would you recommend going about making maps? Well, uh, Colin Duff, uh, you haven't watched my YouTube channel or any channel that I've ever been on. Um, that's, that's a good thing because it means you can go and explore and discover all sorts of cool and wonderful stuff. I am going to sing their praises from now until the day I die because it is the coolest map making software that is out there. Go and look for dungeonfog.com. Dungeonfog.com com um i cannot 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 say this enough it is as far as i'm concerned the best ma map making software that's out there they are a sponsor of the show jean valero uh, jean valero thank you for that uh, super chat donation we do appreciate that um dungeon fog they are sponsors of the channel so yes uh, they have they have given me money to say nice things about them i would be doing that anyway i really i really i can't say this enough um super Shh. easy it was super easy <laughs> i mean it really is it's it i have used all of the other map making software that i could possibly lay my hands on i have drawn my own maps and it's really 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 easy so dungeonfog.com go check it out uh, and if anyone if anyone has negative things to say let me know because I happen to know the owner of the company and I can say, hey, look, these are the negative things. Fix them. Um, so we can really make a change, which is, which is important for me. All right. We are going to do this. Watch your eyes because this has to play. Right. If that didn't wake you up, I don't know what will. Creative writing. For those of you who don't know what the creative writing period is, hold your questions for now. We will come back to the questions at quarter two. So hold your questions for now. Now, creative writing is an opportunity for you to stretch your creative skills, to think maybe outside the box, or to just practice what you already know. I'm going to pose to you a situation or a question, and then you can think about it for a little bit. And then in the commentary, whether you're on Twitch or on YouTube, you can then write your answer in there not for us to judge it but for us to look at it learn reflect upon think about and go from there so uh that's the purpose of it uh we're sorry we're causing headaches there grizzles i'll i'll fix it i'll fix it uh the headache is possibly um because of 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 things that cause headaches um so there we go all right so creative writing today's creative writing is a challenging one because it is about taking your skills to the next level whether you are a writer whether you are a game master whether you are a player it doesn't matter we are going to be or you are going to be anyway you are going to be describing an emotional state describing an emotional state without telling us what the emotional state is 
okay because we're going to know what it is because i'm going to tell you the one that you have to describe but the point is if we say describe the emotional state of sadness and you write the person looks sad yes that's very clear communication but that doesn't help us that doesn't actually give us a whole lot of information which it could if you didn't use the word sad and don't go the person had a look of despair upon their face don't describe the emotion show us that emotion and i want you to use things outside of the box so don't just think about hand gestures or facial features or language think about wardrobe what type of wardrobe would this person be wearing to show this and if you think i'm completely mad in film we do this all the time we specifically choose costume colors and wardrobe and styling for the character for the emotion of the scene that they're in you should be doing the same thing if you really want to elevate your game mastering uh to the next level so the first emotion this is an every a quivering lip sure grizzles it's a great starting point a quivering lip can mean many things a tear sure we're using sledgehammers at the moment think more refined ways but we're not talking about sadness that was an example the very first emotion that you need to describe as actions as sounds as colors as wardrobe as actions everything except using the actual word or any words associated or related with happiness happiness give me a sentence that tells me that the character is happy describe the character describe the situation of the character describe what the character is doing describe everything that you can to convey happiness without ever stating the character is happy or the character is joyful the character is mirthful the character has um an air of joviality joviality all those kinds of things don't do that i want i want i want happiness i see white tiger's off thank you white tiger we will see you tomorrow for goes to salt marsh all right so happiness happiness mike do you what do you do when you're trying to 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 create emotional states within npcs and things what are your kind of go-tos do you do you just use the word they look sad do no you? well i mean i it's different because, you know, I have a creative writing degree, too. So I'm used to doing all of those those things of, you know. If you want to describe someone as being happy, you need to do it in a way that they're not talking. If they are just there completely standing still, how could you tell that they're happy? Hmm there would be an extra sparkle in their eye. Um, it may be, like you mentioned, their, their, their clothing choice. Um, light, airy, colorful, you know, let's assume that it's, you know, someone wearing a dress. It's a light, airy, colorful summer dress type thing. Um, they've got a little twinkle in their eyes. Um, it also has to do a lot with posture. How, you know, if you're, if you're sitting up nice and tall, you know, you're, you're awake, you're engaged, you're, you know, in the moment, um, you can also do that with, if somebody's happy, they, 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 their chest may protrude out a little bit more, you know, their, their, their posture is better. Somebody that's sad or downtrodden, you know, they're going to be all bent over and, mm. and, and frumpy, those kind of things. Um, one of the I think we've talked about this before about mm -hmm. like going to a, a large public place like a mall or a restaurant and you sit there and you you can both be watching a, a person or a couple or a group of people and try to figure out a story for those yes. people. I mean it's gonna be completely wrong, but you can you can if you see a guy walking down uh, you know the street or whatever, he's shuffling his feet. He's bent over. Um, he, his eyes are, are kind of droopy. They're, they're not fully wide open. They're, they're half closed. And he's looking down at the ground um, a lot. Um, perhaps he's got his hands in his pockets. 
um, looks very sullen. You know, the story could be that, you know, that's um, that's Barney. And uh, unfortunately, Barney lost his job this morning. He got fired. Um, and so now Barney is on his way to the local watering hole and he's going to get plastered um, before going home and, and telling his lovely wife Ethel of 47 years that he lost his job and, uh, you know, we're going to have to move in with the kids and all that. <laughs> you know, you just come up with all those things <laughs> off, the, off the fly right. when you're just watching people. And I think that's a really good exercise for getting used to doing the whole show, don't tell thing. And I think there's some absolutely stunning examples coming through. Uh, I'm going to read just a few of them out. Uh, character left his home humming a vivid tune, put on his sunglasses, took a look at the blue sky and let out a sigh with the edges of his lips curled upwards. Uh, the colours were brighter through her eyes, which twinkled almost as brightly as her gentle smile, her breath carefree as she went through the park, dancing around the trees that adorned it. Uh, Yellen practically floated in the light and airy room. The sunlight danced with the breeze through the window, whispering and spinning around her, swirling her dress and making her gems sparkle. There are some wonderful, wonderful examples coming through. It's great. Uh, I see Wolvie's and has joined us. The sky glowed in warmth, the fragrance, the fragrance of flowers on the air. He stood by the warmth of his open window, watching people dancing through the streets. He closes the window, sits down and sips his tea. Eh, contentment. Uh, I quite like that. Um, Catsy86. Mary came bouncing into the room, her eyes sparkling. It's time. It's time. Yes, dear. But it's not till tonight. Please sit down. You're going to knock over my towels. Towels? She sat, mm. but could hardly sit still. I like that one. There's lots of energy. There's, there's, it's very dynamic. And there's dialogue in there as well, which helps give us a little bit of sense of the character. Bella hopped up and rushed to her wardrobe in a staccato of many short steps. Finally, it was time to wear her yellow silks and satins. What I like about that one from Kath uh, Catherine Bischoff is the word staccato is obviously it's a musical term for chum, 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 short, sharp notes uh, played uh, together fairly quickly. Um, and it, it, I can almost hear her footsteps as she quickly runs over. There's that enthusiasm. There's that eagerness. All right. So you've done. Sorry. One, one thing that a lot of these are, are, are very good. Um, one that particularly jumps out to me is from Blake Barn. Um, uh, she, yes. Elaine bounced with every step she took, twirling on her toes as she saw fit. The, the one word that I really, really love in that is twirling. Yes. Twirling. It's an, it's an action word. It, it says so much in just one word. Um, I wrote a ton of poetry uh, in in college, and that's where most of you know the stuff from my creative writing degree came from was poetry and, and some short stories. But if you really want to be as succinct as possible in describing things, in showing and not just telling, just look at poetry. Poets will take a specific word and it, it, they choose that specific word for a reason. Twirling is an amazing word. To twirl. You get, you get so much information in just that one word. You don't have to go through a, a full, right. big, long, sentence. run-on sentence. Twirling says it all. There we go. Twirling, the word of the day. I kind of like the way it sounds. Twirling. Twirling. Now, there is one that I have to read out. And Kirk Wagner, I'm giving you 500 experience points for this because it's absolutely brilliant. I couldn't stop smiling the whole way through it. <laughs> Kirk Wagner wrote, Klingons don't skip. Yet class standing form gave off the impression of skipping. Perhaps it was his clenched teeth or the manic wildness of his eyes. Skipping would have been preferred. Klingons do not skip. I am not a merry man. Um, I like, I love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. All right. Uh, so yes, the Duke of Doom, that's the $10 word right there. Twirling, twirling, twirling. All right. So happiness is, is I think it's easy enough for you guys to, to, to grasp that. 
We've got just a little bit of time. I mean, this has been absolutely insightful uh, having you, Mike, uh, having you here. Save a tooth. You've got a long one that's run over two two lines. I love it. Um, so the the next emotion, the last emotion that we're going to look at, and then we're going to go back to questions. Um, yes, I am not a merry man. Uh, I like that one too. That was a crazy episode. But anyway, uh, the last one we're going to look at, and this is a little bit more tricky because this one is subtle, I think. I think, I think, I think. The last, well, the emotion we're going to look at, and I don't know if it's an emotion or not, but anyway, it's a thing. We're going to look at it. We're going to do it. Is proud. How would you show someone is proud of an action, either that they have done or that someone else has done and that they have helped them do? So proud. The, 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 the big emotions, happiness, sadness, uh, anger, those kinds of things, we can, we can solve fairly easily. I think proud for me when i was coming up with these ideas i was like well proud how do you show that someone is proud i think that can be quite tricky and it's often useful for us in our games because a proud character can sometimes come across as being evil and sometimes or arrogant, or arrogant evil or arrogant mm -hmm. but sometimes we need our npcs to be proud of our pcs and we need to show them that it's really good to reinforce when your PCs do something right. And I saw that there was a question that came through, but it just got lost before I could ask it out loud, was that how do we get our PCs to engage in NPC, in role playing? How do we get them to do that? Well, if the NPC comes up to the PCs and you describe how they are proud, and I'm not going to give away how I would do it, it will make the PCs and by extension the player really feel as if they did a good job and that's something that maybe we don't do enough of in our games so let's have a look at that uh how would you describe being proud without saying they proudly with pride you've made me proud don't do any of that stuff um so 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 don't do that uh yes um robert selvia i am so jealous i am so jealous i didn't get to see the seth uh, seth stream so um it's because I didn't break any laws, I think, that he probably, you know, just quietly snuck it in on the side. All right, get your answers in for how do you demonstrate proudness? How do you demonstrate pride in something well done or in doing something well uh, and accomplishing something? Uh, Angus boys first out the block there. Check chest stuck out, shoulders wide. He helped himself with a grace and uh, he held himself with a grace and poise befitting a man of great standing and he knows it or he knew it that could be pride pride in oneself i suppose mm -hmm. i'm not sure if it's pushing it as far as it could go let's 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 look for let's look deeper uh ogre barbarian says once he realized what had been accomplished he knew he must tell all he met of what had transpired in the kitchen that day the day he fell seven <laughs> the day he fell seven flies in a single swing of his swatter that is definitely describing something that is proud worthy is it showing me is it giving us an indication of how he is being proud we know of his intent he's going to tell everybody but does that convey us in terms of looking at him is he going to be proud so think about it think about it uh, Angus, it's not weak. It's a beginning. I think that's the important thing. A lot of people, and it's including myself, a lot of people will write something and they go, oh, it's, it's bad. It's bad. And then they leave it. And that's the saddest point. The most difficult thing when it comes to running a game or writing a book is actually writing something. And then, and then realizing the hard part is over. The rest is fun because now... Because <laughs> now it's the editor's job. <laughs> now it's the editor's problem. That's right. So if you don't know, Mike's my editor on my book, the latest book that's come out. But what it, what it means is that you now have something to fix. Whereas before you wrote it, there was nothing to fix. There was nothing in existence. So even that sentence, you go, oh, it was weak. Whatever. It doesn't matter. It was written. Mm -hmm. So now you can make it better. Now you can build onto it. Whereas people who haven't written anything, they got nothing. And that to me is, is, is a, real, a real thing uh, to, to, to really motivate you and keep you going if, if that's the case. Uh, let's see another. Okay, we got three minutes, three more minutes, and then we're going to go back to questions. Um, Faliona, Captain Falk made a long shadow in his regal uniform. 
His new medal glinted in the bright sunlight. I think that's pretty nice. It's quite evocative in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'd like to see a little bit more. Uh, Panzer von Lobrow says, when asked the time of day, he felt so haughty as to not even give the time. Is that pride? I think that's arrogance, maybe. Maybe they can't read clocks. Maybe they can't read clocks. There we go. So All we, right. we talked a little bit before about the, with the happiness thing about how you could look at the way someone presents themselves physically and their, their posture and those kind of things. When it comes to pridefulness, the way I would try to describe it would be to, to look at any stereotypical parent and how they talk about their children that they're so proud of the of little Johnny that did this drawing in, in kindergarten or, you know, Sally got, you know, first in her class of something or other. Um, and that's a good way of doing it. And I do that, you know, with, with my kids as well. You know, I keep talking about um, it's not saying that I'm proud of my children. I would say, oh, and Ethan did this and Abby did that and so on and so forth. And it just keeps getting mentioned over and over and over again. And I think that's a prideful thing is repeating something over and over. You know, if it's something funny that my son has done, Guy might have heard it three or four times already. And he's just being polite and didn't say, dude, I already heard that story. But it's, it's a prideful thing. I'm proud of my son. And, you know, so... What else we got? Did you fall asleep? No, we got okay. some nice ones. We got some nice ones. I'm listening to what you're saying, and it's absolutely right. Um, there's so many coming through. Wolvie Zandalari. The wind hushed as the boy jerked the string back loose. The arrow came sailing through the air to its target true. The step of boots behind a hefty hand on the boy's shoulder. A father smiling. It's a setup, and then it's a payoff. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, there's so many. Uh, Ethan Bascom. Yeah, well done, lad. Uh, way to write a name Haragrim said as he knelt in the red sand I knew I never should have trained you chin held high he handed me his sword I don't understand why he says I knew I never should have trained you did I read that wrong I'm not I think I get what you're driving at but I think there might be some confusion in there so it, it could have been you know that they were they were fighting Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> As he knelt in the red sand, I knew I never should have trained. Oh, I see. Yeah. No, because I shouldn't, if, have, I shouldn't have trained you because you've now beaten me. Now you'd kick my butt, yeah. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. So, sometimes we need clarification. We need to, to, to develop yeah, it further. Yeah, chin held high as he handed me, me his, his sword. Right. Yeah, so they were, they were fighting. Maybe a grin. We were brothers, Anakin! kind of deal <laughs> why do you go there of all freaking places uh goblin pile driver says a curl formed at the edge of his mouth as he fought back a smile surveying the aftermath of his deed he allowed himself to rest for the first time in a long while pride proud and activity i think so or perhaps also relaxation or even satisfaction could be coming through there you see how once we start getting into these things the more complicated emotions it starts to become a little bit difficult more difficult to convey the true sense of what we are meaning without sort of trying to have long rambling things um let's do one more do you want to choose one you choose one whilst mike is choosing one where well, you can start asking questions again we've got nine minutes until the end of the stream I, the time has gone so quickly i don't even know what happened it's so 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 cool um i i, I yeah any more questions about role playing or gaming or we just finish off with with creative writing either way i'm ecstatic i think it's a lot of fun um it is harder to convey that's why yeah you use the setup wolvie absolutely agree with you um pride is quite reminiscent of confidence they are expressed in the same way says the true viking yes and uh, no as well i think confidence can be expressed in other ways certainly um have you found one that you like um they're all they're all good but the that last one with that twirling that would that just jumped right out twirling at me. has got mike twirling mike was, is mike is gonna twirl my my head is twirling 
<laughs> Mike is gonna twirl. All right, so back to quiz and guys, thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much for participating in creative writing. I hope these little things kind of get the little gray cells going and 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 get you to think about things other than just saying, with pride I look at you. Think about uh, chest puffed up or how how have you did? Um, tuberiosis. Uh, usually you would put a question in front of your question before you ask it, but because you're the first one, uh, we get there. Um, how would you run a one-on-one -on -one campaign? I have done videos on the YouTube channel, one-on-one -on -one campaigns. It's a much more intimate campaign. The character is definitely the focus of the story. You run it more like a film than you would with a group of people, which is more like an ensemble cast or series. So with a film, the character is definitely the center of the story, and you should make sure that that's where they stay throughout. They should be the ones making the decisions, not the uh, NPCs. Uh, definitely, definitely make sure that they are the ones that are, are driving uh the, the the narrative so bear that in mind uh grizzle says medicine outside of magic how effective should it be in comparison oh that's a big one you're a pathfinder fan where medicine is more realistic than D D. in terms of your none of them are realistic well none of them are realistic magic. sure but but your your medicine in, in in i say your medicine but in pathfinder medicine checks and things they don't really restore a lot of health they, they're not going to get no. you straight back up on the battlefield they're um, going to take days right pathfinder does have a way of of a character becoming a doctor and right. and those have different um levels of how fast they could heal and okay but it's still like nowhere near magic level right no it's not magic level but we, we were talking earlier uh, someone was doing a low level low magic gritty campaign in that one, uh, in that type of campaign, you would have to uh, bump up all the, the the natural healing that's that's in the mm. world, mm. because without a lot of magic, that means there's not a lot of healing magic either, and it's going to be much harder for the party to survive without healing potions and wands of cure light wounds and divine intervention and all that kind of stuff it's gonna be very difficult yeah absolutely uh poetical review says how do i make dramatic moments more emotional how do you make dramatic moments mm. more emotional the quick answer, because we are running out of time and there's so many more questions coming through. The quick answer, I would say anyway, is that dramatic moments are only dramatic if the players, characters, and by extension the players are invested in the scene. Mm -hmm. So if they see the princess running over to the other princess, grabbing her and sweeping her off her feet and begging her to marry them, they're going to go, okay, that was nice. On the other hand, if they have fought long and hard to get that princess out of the dungeon got her to the castle and they had previously fought for the other princess uh, to convince her to get there and all that kind of stuff i think that that is that is suddenly when they embrace for the first moment and the ple the pcs have hard work that's wrong order worked hard to get there suddenly now there's more emotional context because the players and the pcs are invested in the story so just showing stuff off screen it doesn't matter how good an actor you are it's unlikely to affect you it just reminds me of um the last time that you were here you mm. asked me we were driving somewhere sometime and, and you asked me what makes an encounter memorable and that was just what you were talking about it it has to have an emotional connection not only to the character but to the player um, in, in my campaign, they, there was this little goblin woman that was in town and eventually she warmed over the PCs. They thought of her as a friend. They were buying her gifts, all of that kind of stuff. They were very attached to this little goblin woman NPC and something happened in town. And anyway, the townsfolk, uh, blamed this little goblin woman for all the woes in the town and they burned her at the stake right in front of the PCs where the PCs could not do anything about it. And because of that connection that we have built up over many, many, many sessions, there were some players at my table that literally had tears mm -hmm. in their eyes having to think about watching this person being burned at the stake. 
You know, absolutely. Very absolutely. emotional. It is about building into it. One doesn't just have emotional reactions uh, to things. So, so one has to be, you know, you, over, overnight you have to build into these things. So I think that's a good one. Um, there's another question there. Uh, what are we doing for time? We've got three minutes. Um, okay. So I think we're going to have to start wrapping up all these questions coming through. Uh, Patreon games. Um, yes. Uh, so are there other ways to support the channel? Yes, of course there are other ways to support the channel. Patreonage is, is great and it's amazing. Um, but supporting the channel is sharing it on social media and going on to Reddit and asking questions. And I think also making sure that whichever of the, the channels you, you, you look at, because there's so many of them, you don't have to choose just one before, you know, one over the others. I think sharing them on whatever social media you might be on. And I know a lot of people say, mm -hmm. oh, but I'm not very active on social media and, and the like. Popping onto Reddit and, and making a post certainly helps. I mean, that's how How to Be a Great GM started was we had someone on, on Reddit post a comment and, and people came to see what was going on and we went from zero to two and a half thousand subscribers overnight, quite literally. So that's 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 hugely important. I think also just being active in the community, if you don't know, discord.gg forward slash great GM is where you will find our Discord server and that will lead you also to Mike's Discord server for, for Game Masters Vault. Um, but join the Discord server where there's lots of people to talk to. I'm there as often as I can be. I'll be more active once I'm back in Japan. And the book is, is well, the book is now done. So uh, I've got a bit more sort of spree, free time uh, on my hands to, 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 to go back onto Discord. So there's all, all sorts of ways of, of supporting the channel. And just watching, liking, and subscribing, of course, is a major one. Questions that we couldn't answer, if you head on over to our Discord server, again, discord.gg forward slash great GM, you can drop your questions in there. I will be looking at them, I promise, on Monday or Tuesday or so, because this weekend is crazy. Ghost of Salt Marsh resumes. If you don't know what that is, that's the live play that I do for D&D. That's twitch.tv forward slash D&D, for which Mike happens to be the uh, OBS goblin. He runs all of the the cool uh, graphics and overlays and things that happen uh, during the show. Um, so that uh, that should be a lot of fun tomorrow as we resume the curse of the Kraken. It's going to be so much fun. Three episodes left. And like I said, a big announcement tomorrow on the show. So watch out for that um, thing uh, tomorrow. Anyway, from myself, Mike, I just want to say thank you for being on the show. Mm -hmm. It really was a pleasure. I yeah. enjoyed having you here. I hope that you guys enjoyed having Mike in as well. Uh, we've had a couple guest celebrities on. We've had, um, well, we've had uh, Dave from Nerdarchy. We had Till, and now we've had you. So mm -hmm. uh, I must admit, I quite like it. I don't know if you like it. If you want me to reach out to more GMs or people just in general to be on these Friday shows, or whether you prefer it just to be um, yours truly um, with with the character. I, I, I still haven't chosen a name yet. I mean, we've run out of time. We really are on the timeline. Um, I liked Snark. Snark kind of came into mind. Booger did not come into mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm vetoing that one. Uh, it's like draggy McDrag face. No. Um, I, I, yeah. Um, snark. I think. I think Snark. It's. It's. I think it's going to be Snark. Uh, I'll sleep on it. Anyway. Until next time. I want to thank you all for participating, for being here, for contributing, and for just being awesome. I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming. Thank you.